All right, we're we a little bit late, so we better start right ahead. Uh, my name is David Hildenbrand. I'm a software engineer at IBM. Uh, I work on KVM for IBM C Systems, aka S390X, aka the good old mainframe. And today I want to talk about an interesting topic called nested virtualization on IBM C Systems, um, especially in the context of KVM, of course. So first of all, uh, don't be scared. Um, there is like a little bit complicated stuff in there, especially when it comes to memory management. Um, I tend to understand it from time to time, so in case you have any questions, just to feel free to speak up and I'll try my best to explain it. Beautiful. <laughs> More time for the trademarks? Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm going to go briefly about the basic contact, uh, concept of nested virtualization, and then we'll quickly move on to um, what virtualization uh, looks like on IBM C systems. Uh, then we're going to go into the real details of how we made it running on the uh, IBM C systems. Um, after then having you like completely confused, uh, we'll have a look at the current status, some interesting performance numbers, a short discussion about security, uh, and in the end, I'm going to just give a short summary and an outlook, and maybe we'll have some time for questions. So um, what is nested virtualization? Um, the idea is actually quite simple. Uh, you have a virtual machine, and you want to allow that virtual machine to run virtual machines itself. Um, in the context of KVM, then would then look something like that. Um, and you ask, may ask yourself then, um, so what is this good for? Why would I wa even want to do something like that? I mean, one use case, of course, is um, if you sell somebody a virtual machine and you want to allow that one to like resell virtual machines or to start virtual machines for testing purposes, stuff like that, um, then something like that could be useful. Um, but until now, this is really mainly only used as a test and uh, debugging mechanism. Um, because you have like a much more access to hardware virtualization and can like get a more detailed look what is actually happening. Um, once you uh, implement further hardware, deep, uh, hardware um, virtualization support, you can actually simulate different hardware virtualization variances and uh, use this as a perfect testing mechanism for like new KVM releases or stuff like that. So, I mean, actually, you just want to run virtual machines inside your virtual machine. So what you could do is you could simply go like one of the PowerPC way and uh, do a trap and emulate approach in your guest. It will not perform well, but like you wouldn't have to implement extra nested virtualization support in KVM. So what you can do instead is if your hardware doesn't like give you support for nested virtualization out of the box, um, you can actually emulate hardware virtualization for your guests by reusing hardware virtualization yourself, which makes that whole process quite fast uh, and quite secure. So um, basically, it then t looks something like that. Uh, whenever your guest tries to execute a virtual uh, guest itself, um, you just take control and like emulate the whole process by doing some kind of shadow execution because you have to work on shadow data structures in that case. Um, the nice thing about that is as soon as you have it properly running on one level, it simply cascades so you can like go one level further, nested under nested, and like even further, we'll talk about that one later on. Um, but in, interestingly, until now, only x86 was able to like really simulate hardware virtualization for its guests to provide nested virtualization support. And um, now also S390X can do that with KVM. So um, you might wonder um, why did the first slide say uh, nesting nested virtualization? Well, basically on IBM C systems, we always have at least one level of virtualization, um, which is provided by the PRISM, the ALPA hypervisor, which just cuts like the hardware into logical slices. Um, this is really like a, a really fast hypervisor. And on top of that, we uh, are able to, for example, run under Linux KVM uh, or the classical hypervisor CVM. 
um, which is then already like level two, already some kind of nested virtualization. But of course, what we want to do is do yet another level of virtualization, um, for example, running KVM under KVM or KVM under CVM, and then we're actually already in level three. So that might, might sound like it doesn't perform at all, but we'll say, let's see later on that this is actually quite good. Um, in order to make use of hardware virtualization in IBM C systems, you have to execute the sci instruction, which simply says uh, start interpretive execution, and then your, logic, uh, your CPU actually executes the vCPU uh, in, the, in the back end. So uh, something like the VM entry, VM exit on x86. And um, like, usually you want to like go further and improve hardware virtualization, and this is uh, represented as so-called Psi facilities that, for example, provide performance speed-ups or additional features for your hardware virtualization. Um, and we'll see later on like how far we were able to even virtualize these facilities. Now, um, as I said, as soon as the CPU executes the uh, sign instruction, it executes actually the virtual CPU. And as soon as there is a host interrupt or um, an intercept has to be processed, so the CPU has to take control and, like, for example, emulate an instruction, uh, we fall back into the CPU. Now, of course, we have to describe this whole guest state somehow. And on the one hand, we have the so-called Psi control block, which describes the state of the virtual CPU. And on the other hand, we have the so-called GMAP, um, which is actually the name under Linux, uh, the guest mapping, which is just an address space that represents the guest physical memory. Um, so the sign instruction is executed in this address space, uh, given the Psi control block, uh, and then the vCPU can run. Now, um, if we take a look at the memory management perspective, um, it all starts out by a QMU process, which contains some um, memory slots. So um, the guest physical memory is actually contained somewhere in this QMU process. And what we have to do in order um, to make the Psi use it is we have to map that all um, to the real addresses we want it to be. So that would mean that um, for example, um, address zero for the guest has really to lie at address zero and not something like in user space at, at like a really high address. Um, and we do that by um, sharing certain page tables, uh, which is quite nice because as soon as we fold the page into our QMU process and it is mapped into our guest mapping, it is automatically contained in our GMAP, uh, which doesn't like require a lot of effort. Um, if we take a look at the control, uh, uh, control blocks, we have the side control blocks, which describes the state of the virtual CPU, and it contains some execution controls, how we call it, so um, like some mechanism to actually control the way hardware virtualization is done. But in addition, this control block references so-called satellite control blocks that either contain, for example, additional registers for our virtual CPU, uh, further control blocks, and uh, the so-called system control area. I'm not going to go too, too much into detail here. It is basically a mean to um, make the hardware aware which virtual CPUs belong together and then do some like additional performance improvements. But the most important thing here is that in this uh, system control area lies a lock that can be used uh, to coordinate certain changes done to address spaces between the hypervisor and the hardware virtualization. And that one is important later on. Now, this whole process of emulating hardware virtualization um, for our guests, so emulating the SI instruction is called uh, virtual SI, uh, aka vSI. And it basically works uh, the way that we have to shadow certain control blocks, so we have to copy them. Um, in addition, we have to take care that we create a shadow address space, so we have to like mimic whatever the guest CPU, uh, guest CPU wants us to do. And basically, uh, we start out by intercepting the sign instruction, so the guest wants to execute hardware virtualization. Uh, we shadow blocks, we perform some black magic related to um, the guest address space, the shadow address space. Then we can actually execute hardware virtualization, the SI, on behalf of our virtual CPU. 
Um, of course, we then have to take care of page faults we get because we are page faulting on the shadow address space. So we have to like do some black magic to resolve that. And eventually, we are able to rerun that hardware virtualization mode. Or we, for example, have to um, inject a page fault into our guest CPU so it can res uh, resolve that fault for um, its own guest. So this is like the big picture. And um, I see some confused faces. That's why I'm going to go into more detail. <laughs> OK, so first of all, we want to know whenever our guest executes the sign instruction. That is done quite easily because it's already done. We just have to plug in our emulation code. Second step is um, we have to copy this uh, site control block out of guest memory into our host memory because we want to filter it. So we really want to have control what our guest wants to do. Um, and we have to take care of all these satellite control blocks because these pointers are only valid in guest memory but not in our hypervisor memory. And the good news are that for most of these control blocks, we can simply translate the address, pin it in host memory, and like re rewire it up in our shadow control block. Um, for some of them, unfortunately, because there are 31-bit addresses, we have to actually shadow them, but these are only two. And like we have some performance improvements done at that point to avoid, avoid it at most of the times. Um, but interestingly, we have this system control area, as I said previously, that links all these side control blocks of one VM together. And these pointers are not valid in our hypervisor context. They are valid in guest storage. So um, what we want to do here is we want to just forward this whole block because shadowing a lock is really evil and a, like that could be hardly done. So what we do here, we simply forward the block um, but tell hardware virtualization to never ever access one of these linked side control blocks because the pointers are just broken. Um, so that is like the, the basic thing we, we have to do to guarantee that we have a valid control block for our nested KVM guest. Well, actually, uh, at that point, we are already able to execute the SI on behalf of our uh, KVM guest to execute the nested KVM guest, um, except one tiny little detail, the uh, shadow address space, which is like yet another another level of complexity, let's put it that way. Um, so it all starts out that um, when we start running our nested KVM guest, we have a completely empty shadow address space. But whenever we get a fault while executing our nested KVM guest, we try to resolve that fault by shadowing it in our shadow uh, address space. And of course, the only way to make that work is we have to manually walk the page tables our guest provided us by reading in a guest memory, which is like really ugly. Um, we then have to like create all these shadow hierarchies of page tables uh, and eventually we'll arrive at the lowest level where we can actually plug in in our shadow uh, address space a physical host, host uh, page and um, Basically, then we can rerun the SI. But of course, that would be too simple um, because we have to watch out for changes uh, done to the original page table we are shadowing. Because, for example, our KVM guest could just go ahead and change the page tables in its GMAP. Um, and we have to like take control at that point and make sure that our shadow page tables don't contain these entries anymore, or even the updated ones. Um, on the other hand, for example, on our hypervisor, so we could just um, take certain pages out of our original KVM guest and page them out. But in the end, as they are also contained in our shadow page table, somehow we have to take control again and make sure that we really unshadow everything that could be affected. This is actually quite complicated, but we were able to realize it by uh, protecting page table entries on our original GMAP, doing some crazy unshadowing action, uh, 
depending on what, what is going on in our GMAP. And um, in the end, we can now guarantee that we only have valid entries in our um, shadow address space. Uh, and whenever something is done by our KVM guest or by our hypervisor, it simply gets unshadowed. Now, that slide is a little bit more easier to understand then. Um, basically, uh, after we have done this crazy uh, management of our shadow GMAP, we can simply re-execute hardware, uh, hardware virtualization as long as possible. Um, at one point in time, we might have to like, propagate an intercept to our guest itself, or while trying to resolve a fault on our shadow uh, address space, we might have to actually forward a page fault to our KVM guest so it can process that. Um, before we then can uh, leave this emulation of hardware virtualization, we have to unshadow all the control blocks we shadowed previously. And uh, luckily, we only have to care about the shadow control, uh, the side control block. Um, we simply have to copy selected values back. And then we're ready to go. We can re-execute our real KVM guest, and it can then just like do whatever it wants to do, uh, resolve page faults, handle intercepts, and so on. Now, current state. Good news are we basically allow all um, allow our nested KVM guests to have all features our ordinary KVM guests have, uh, including vector registers to support transaction execution, even huge pages with up to two gigabyte pages. Um, it can have up to actually 255 virtual CPUs right now um, with a tiny little patch that is still missing, um, except of one facility, so one feature that is called a collaborative memory management. Um, and this is then the place where uh, we can provide all hardware virtualization features for our nested KVM guests because it's simply too complicated. And at that one point, uh, for example, I'm just going to go quickly over that, um, is I mentioned the system control area with these invalid pointers hanging around there. We can't enable these. And on the other hand, our shadow address tables don't totally mimic the original page tables we're shadowing. So we have some entries that might be empty, although they are not. So that uh, like doesn't really allow us to enable all hardware virtualization features. For now, uh, there are no known bugs out there in the implementation. But of course, a lot of uh, testing is missing. So that statement <laughs> might be true, might not be true. So uh, in the end, I don't know of any bugs. And I also don't know of any incompatibilities um, to the like, yet not published architecture. Um, but there is a tiny little one. But in general, uh, we took care that everything should be handled. Um, still, until now, you manually have to enable nested KVM support in the um, KVM module, just like on x86. But there is like a discussion going on right now whether they could eventually enable it uh, as default. And I think once they enable it, we can also enable it after like doing some more review. Um, S390X doesn't have CPU model support yet, um, but we need it in order to turn it on to, like, to show our KVM guests that it has hardware virtualization. Um, we have a prototype. We even have like, uh, various uh, versions already out there on the QMU mailing list. So we'll see that one soon. Um, and with CPU model support, you can actually use it once you have turned it on in the KVM module. Now, the really cool thing is that uh, migration works out of the box. So you can live migrate. I, I was able, for example, to start two levels of nested KVM guests and then just um, save, to, save to disk, do a managed save of my hypervisor, so my first KVM guest in that, that case. Um, and it basically works because all state of the nested KVM guest is completely contained in our KVM guest. So by simply migrating the main memory of, a, of our KVM guest, we implicitly migrate our complete nested KVM guest. And all these shadow structure we're building up in our hypervisor, they will simply be silently recreated on the new target. So that is pretty cool. Another cool thing uh, when talking about security is that um, 
We don't emulate any instructions for our VSI, so for our nested KVM guests, that is all done by the hardware or by the ordinary KVM code. And we don't uh, inject any interrupts into our VSI guests. Again, this is either done completely by our hardware virtualization or it is like done just as now by our KVM guests. Um, of course, we take care that when we actually copy, when we shadow this control block or all control blocks, that we only allow selected values. Uh, and as the shadow GMAP, the shadow address space is completely based on the original address space of our KVM guests, there isn't really much that can break as long as we take care of properly flushing the TLBs. But as we all know, flushing TLB can be quite hard. Um, but we, I mean, we really debugged, debugged that probably. Um, so there might be something in there, but uh, it's pretty stable at that point. Now, performance. Um, performance is interesting. <laughs> uh, you can see like a big spike out there, but that is actually uh, uh, nested under nested. So um, what I did here, I compiled a kernel um, four times on the same machine, one time on like L part, the lowest level we can go, under KVM guest, under nested KVM, and even a level further. And what we can see is that first memory access is expensive, but as soon as every memory of the guest has been touched, there is barely an overhead. I mean, even in run number three, we were like faster in the nested KVM guest compared to our KVM guest. Um, of course, this is like uh, there is some variance because the hardware was not totally dedicated, so these are not like absolute numbers here. Uh, but in general, like once we touch touched memory, uh, performance is pretty good. So it was like roughly like minus two to plus five percent after it has been touched. Um, now the main problem is that we run when we run nested KVM under nested KVM is that we actually have to build shadow page tables on shadow page tables, which results in constant unshadow shadow operations, page faults going up and down in the stack. Um, so while that may, might not be like op, the optimum right now, um, there is hardly some, anything we can do about it. And in the end, we don't care because like most of the time, we will only care about like guest level three and Guest level four is just like a test case to see if nested virtualization cascades if we did everything correct. Interestingly also, I mean, I was using multi parallel virtualized disks here and I wanted to see if this is like some effect of well, some caching effect because we already compiled the kernel. Um, but even when I rebooted like the, the lowest level, uh, no, not the lowest level, for example, if I rebooted guest level four, and rerun the test, the numbers just stay the same, so that was not some kind of um, cache here that kicked in. Okay, now, how, how deep can we go? How far can we go? Um, actually, as I said, level one is the lowest level we can, we can have. There is no level zero on S390X. Um, and actually, our hardware limits us to uh, eight levels because then some control blocks you have where you can actually see on which level you are running are simply full because, I mean, uh, eight levels are more than enough. And it took like a, a whole lot of uh, cat videos on YouTube to reach level six. Um, so to start a kernel took like, uh, really, I had to go to lunch and go back and then I only had booted a kernel. So it tends to get really, really slow uh, the further you go down. Um, and the question would then be, can we somehow improve this building shadow page tables on shadow page tables on shadow page tables and just like, uh, just like producing steel time? So that is uh, really the main question. Um, interestingly, while doing this whole, whole thing, um, our KVM implementation is now able to run with a minimal amount of hardware virtualization facilities. So that was one nice side effect um, because like I tried to test everything and uh, just implemented that then. And uh, we actually found one random memory override in the, in the kernel um, while running nested KVM, um, most, mostly because I was starting like hundreds and hundreds of guests in a row and at one point I got crazy error messages. Um, 
The thing is right now, because we have to shadow certain control blocks on DMA pages that uh, we require one DMA page for each virtual CPU we have. And as you might be aware, uh, you can easily run out of DMA pages. Um, so the question would then be, can we at one point of time reduce the amount of DMA pages and um, make the whole process even faster because we maintain a, a cache of shadow control blocks and um, if we can reduce the amount of DMA pages, we can have more shadow side control blocks in our cache and therefore speed up, for example, overcommitment scenarios. The other thing I already talked about is, can we ever completely drop the um, kvm.nested parameter? So can we enable nested KVM as default? Um, of course, we want to have CPU model support finally integrated so we can enable actually uh, hardware virtualization for our KVM guests. And I mean, the, the plan in the long run is to always support features for nested KVM guests as soon as we support them in the KVM guests. So, I mean, right, right now we have all the features in place. We just have to take care when we implement further, further stuff that we also have that, at that point. All right. So. That's basically it. Are there any questions? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, go back a slide, please. Awesome. Yes. Well, I just get reminded of what I wanted to talk to uh, about. Um, the reason we have the nested parameter in, oh, well, no. Uh, the reason we're using the CPU host model on x86 um, is not because we don't want to have people use nesting. It's because uh, we, well, well, there were two reasons. The first is that, that it that was unstable, but that was a separate safeguard, really. That was more the kernel parameter and the special please enable it part. And um, the reason it's enabled for CPU host is that uh, we just didn't solve the live migration part. That, that really is the main reason why it's not enabled on the default models. Um, so if you have live migration solved, there's no reason not to just enable it by default on all the systems. Except the security audit. Sure. <laughs> so you, 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 have to, you have to be certain that it's secure and that it's safe to use. But once you are, there's nothing holding you back from, from just enabling it by default. Okay. It's I'm perfectly, good. it's valid and it's useful. It's part of the CPU at the end of the day. Right. Um, the other one is your, your comment about um, nesting all the way down. Uh, have you tried so that basically the, the issue you have is uh, the dynamic faulting of, of uh, pages into a guest, right? Um, or well, you actually have two levels. You have uh, one time you, you fault because you just need to have the user space page populated, and then you fault exactly. another time to have your your nested page table um, folded in. Uh, so basically, all you need to do is to reduce those two. The first is easy; you can just pre-populate. Um, uh, we, we could do a mem set on our QMU process, and that would at least avoid a couple of page faults. You can just do an M advice. Um, that's good enough. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for your for your nested page table, you just want to have some whatever it is, some mechanism to tell it please pre-populate before you start. And then at that point, if you just enable those, you shouldn't get any faults during just basically boot up time should be almost the same as in, on every layer. The thing is, as soon as you change the shadow page table, you trigger unshadows on another level. Yes, but you never change them at that point. But you can't like fully, fully create a shadow up front. Why not? If your user space pages are fully paged in uh, and you pre-populate your nesting, nested page table, it won't change over the lifetime of your VM. Yeah, we could do that, but that would then mean that like the first one trying to run a virtual CPU would actually like trigger a whole bunch of like actions on the on the shadow. I mean, you have to populate your complete shadow page tables, yeah. and even then, you're not sure that your host might not simply do a KSM run or page something out or dirty track, and then something gets thrown out of your shadow page tables. Uh, that, that's a tuning problem. Um, you, you still can use it. You can still, I mean, to give it a try. See how fast you get. If that basically gets you into a margin that you can go further than eight layers, you can talk to your architects that you need more, more page, more, more depth <laughs> in, the, in the tables. <laughs> and I, I honestly, I don't, I don't, the, main, the main problem we had on x86, last time I measured it, was I.O. 
um, CPU time was okay-ish further down, I.O. went completely down anything. Like you, you, you just couldn't access any I.O. anymore because you're constantly bouncing on, on MIOs, on PIOs, on interrupts, on everything out there. It was just bouncing back and forth through all the layers. Um, since you don't have that issue, apparently, uh, you should be fine, really, as long as you pre-populate your, your memory. Just give it a try, see if it works, and then you can still disable KSM if you really don't want it. Okay, thanks. Do you have, like, if you use huge pages, does that make the shadowing cheaper? Like, if you use gigabyte pages, then you only have three or four, I don't know how many levels of page tables you have, but... The thing is that we don't support huge pages for KVM backing storage yet. Oh, okay. But we support it for nested KVM. <laughs> <laughs> so what we actually do, so uh, if you would like run a nested KVM guest that has huge pages and creates its own nested KVM guest, I would be able to create fake, fake page tables to simulate that, so that would be possible. And later on we could even optimize for that case um, in some scenarios to, um, in that case, then reduce the amount of uh, like shadow page tables we have to create. Yeah, because in I mean, certain certain scenarios, because a page might be consecutive for our guest, but it doesn't have to do it have to be in our hypervisor where we're creating the shadow page tables. It could be, but it doesn't have to. Yeah, so exactly. I mean, you can just configure 100 uh, gigabyte huge TWFS pages in the first, 95 in the second, 90. Exactly, third, exactly. And then really, you have a thousand. Uh, Enters in the, in the page tables for for all the levels of the guests, so it shouldn't take my, much to shadow and unshadow those. Exactly. As soon as we have it for the backing storage, that would absolutely make sense. Yeah. So how many levels do you have? Six in the page tables. Uh, three plus two. Yeah. Three region, region segment, and page tables. Yeah. But actually, I mean, it depends. You're, you can just like, most of the time, I only get three three levels because like you can vary it. It doesn't have to be five. It's maximum is five. Okay. Any other questions? All right then. Thank you.